I'm Vina Sportis. I work for FB Environmental. We have been helping the town through this process, mostly working with the Magenta Cook River Citizen Advisory Committee, which has been an incredible committee to work with. Um, today, we wanted to bring on some folks that have been intimately involved with this project from its sort of the inception of the grant process and talk us through what that looks like, what that looks like and where we can go with it. Um, and we asked the committee to send in questions and they sent in about 50 amazing questions, a lot of overlap, which was good to see. So we are, um, I'm going to let Allison speak. What? I'm sorry. We're, I'm going to have Allison speak. She's going to give an overview and then Matt, Jamie, and then we're going to do a q and I'll facilitate a QA and a with Matt and Jamie, and then we'll open it up to the public for additional questions. If any questions don't get answered today, please feel free to email us or write them down. I have a pad of paper over there that we can um, pack around as well. Um, and we can bring out more chairs. There's also some in the middle that maybe is annoying to sit in, uh, or annoying to sit in. So I will introduce Allison McKellar. I'm sure most of you know her. <laughs> She will be showing some photos and diving into how and why the town decided to apply for the grant in the first place. Allison is from Camden and currently serves as the vice chair on the select board. She has a love of researching in the history and the McGintic of watershed and the people, places, and issues surrounding the local community. She also writes a column in the local newspaper highlighting much of what she finds through her research. So we're pretty lucky to have her here today to help us understand the whole water, the water that I um, rather than just sort of the singular dam issues that we've been focusing on this far. So thanks, Alison. Okay, thank Hi. you. Hi. Uh, actually, not the vice chair of the select board anymore, um, which which is great. I do um, maybe unfortunately have the distinction of being the longest serving member on the select board right now, which is a position that I really never thought I would be in. Because I like being the the new outsider questioning everything. Um, but I wish when I started on the select board there had been um, somebody kind of explaining all of this history from, from 10, 20 years ago, some of the things that had already been learned about the watershed, things that are in the local newspaper. Um, and I just basically kind of see this as like a whole big puzzle. You know, you look at a watershed map on um, like this, and it's like all these arrows and catchments and basins and it's it's like a puzzle, and that's kind of the way town government is. That's kind of the way regional government is. It's um, everybody has kind of a little a little piece of it, and so um, even just six years ago in 2017, when um, we first uh, were starting to look at the dam issue, the most recent round of looking at the dam issue in Camden, because that has been something that has happened over and over and over again throughout history. Um, it kind of feels like like ancient history a little bit. You know, things six years ago, lots of people go through their life just like I did, not paying attention to town government at all. You know, you pay attention when something catches your interest and um, it's often really hard to, to catch up. So um, I was thinking today, gosh, it's kind of annoying we have to go to Hope for this meeting. Uh, this is a Camden thing. And I was like, oh, what am I doing? Why am I thinking that? Um, you know, I think that's part of the problem. Fort McGonagall Lake has, it, it's in multiple towns and um, we don't really like to go out of our own little sphere. Um, so sometimes it's necessary to go to Hope, um, get out of Camden and to understand what's going on. Um, so this, uh, this picture I took, um, I guess it was last week or the week before, I went out and McGonagall Watershed Association is doing um, uh, float, what's it, what do you call it, float plane, um, sea plane, float plane tours of the watershed. And um, that, it's that yellow plane that we've all been seeing um, for, for years and years driving around. And so that was, um, I've had a drone that I could use to kind of see what's going on, but I could get so much higher with this. And it was the first time I could really see the whole watershed all at once. And um, I found myself saying, even though I know everything on a map, I was like, oh, what's that? What's that? What's that? Um, so that's a really cool opportunity um, for anybody that's interested. That's going to be going on throughout the summer, and it's a fundraiser for the Watershed Association. Um, this year is Moody Pond um, draining in toward McGonagall Lake. Um, that's kind of the outer edge of the watershed um, that drains to Mariner's Brook 
um, down to the lake. Um, so, you know, what started all these dam studies anyway? Is it, is it why are we even looking at this? What does this have to do with anything? Um, when did the town identify this as a priority? Um, so just a quick little thing from, from my perspective, coming in new on the selector in 2017, um, one of the things that came up this year is the Montgomery Dam, uh, repairs to the spillway of the Montgomery Dam. And uh, some of us were new at the time, we said, oh, what's in the Montgomery Dam? Um, what does that do? Um, as with lots of things, it was the fact that it came in over budget that caused everybody to start asking a lot of questions. Um, at the same time, uh, the Seabright Dam, which is another town-owned dam, used to be a hydropower dam. That had a lot of repairs that were needed. Montgomery Dam, uh, those repairs were more aesthetic. Seabright Dam was draining the whole area um, where we swam at Shirt Tail. So that was kind of determined to be the priority. Move forward with that. Realized we had a lot of questions about the Montgomery Dam. There were two options being presented. One was to lower the dam a little bit. Um, we didn't really understand why that was something that we were looking at. Um, so the selector at the time was told, well, you better get used to it. There's a lot of, of repairs, expensive repairs coming up um, for the dams anyway. So they're for a town owned dam. And we're given this whole list that added up to millions of dollars over the next couple of decades. And we all thought, ooh. Um, so um, there was a need to understand more about the pros and cons. Um, a lot of people, as you post something on Facebook, we're going to repair this dam. People are like, well, what, what about the fifth? Why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing this? And um, I personally didn't have a lot of, of answers. I think a lot of us didn't. Um, very quickly, we did um, an initial feasibility study to look at different things at the Montgomery Dam. Um, found that there could be some benefits either removing or lowering it. Um, also, you know, we create the biggest amount of change, raised a lot of questions. We learned that it integrates into Harbor Park a little bit. Nobody wanted to touch that. Uh, so it was like, oh, this is even more complicated than we thought. And a lot of people also said, okay, we before we make any decision about this one dam, we want to understand more about the whole watershed. Um, and, you know, organizations like the Nature Conservancy and um, other partners also said, yeah, before we get involved too, we want to know if the town thinks about the whole watershed. So um, one of the things that the study found is that uh, some changes to Montgomery Dam could reduce the flood risk. Uh, some of us were like, well, is there even a flood risk? Um, what, you know, I haven't heard anybody talk about that recently. Um, and uh, this is one of the things that just shows how fast um, we forget things. This is the cover of the 2006 annual report for the town. Um, and uh, it's a really interesting read. If you open it up and read, um, really anything that Ken Bailey ever wrote about the watershed is really um, useful. He just sort of chronicles these different storms, what, how, the, how the gates were opened or not. And um, it, it, did a, it did a bunch of damage. One of the things um, that he talked about is that the state had come in, this is Route 52 in Lincolnville, the state had come in and they had made the culvert bigger on Route 52 where the water enters into Norton Pond um, because they had been having flooding issues. So they solved their flooding problem by making that culvert bigger, increasing the amount of water that could flow toward Norton Pond. At the same time, um, this area in the Narrows was a smaller culvert. And so the, he said that there were times during that 2005 storm where the Norton Pond was up to three feet higher than McGonagall Lake. So they, a bunch of people got together, the Watershed Association, private property owners, they replaced that um, culvert with a bridge, the Ken Bailey Bridge. Um, and according to Ken at the time, increased the um, flow possibility by uh, four or five times the amount of water could flow through there. Helps solve a lot of problems for, for Norton Pond, I'm told. Um, still, same water though needs to go to the next thing, which is this is the east and the west McGonagall Lake dams. Those control the level of the lake in the you know, McGonagall Lake and Norton Pond. Um, and those, um, the old inspection reports will tell you they've been suggesting for years that the town do a study to see if they can pass a hundred year flood or not. I don't know why that doesn't seem like that nobody wanted to do that. I think it's because they knew the answer um, that it was going to be no and that was going to be expensive. Um, another thing that came up um, when looking for ways to fund the Montgomery Dam repairs 
is um, the 2010 downtown TIF district that the town has that is approved by the state and allows the town to prioritize certain um, projects within a certain district and then sequester some of the tax revenue from that district. So it goes through and, um, and it, you know, it's a voter approved thing, identifies different projects that are a priority for the town. One of the things it said um, was that the town is proposing to lower, and they used the word sluiceway, I think they may have meant spillway, lower the sluiceway of the Montgomery Dam or the downtown dam, they called it, to um, uh, reduce flood risk and also suggested that that correspond with the Main Street bridge um, work that would have to happen in the future. And uh, I thought, what are they talking about? Why? Um, that um, That's because to do work on the Montgomery Dam, you need to lower that, that pool that's behind it. The same thing is true for the Main Street Bridge. And you can see here, um, so when that's drained, there's all kinds of pipes and stuff, and it's kind of a it's kind of a, a mess, but also just it creates an aesthetically not so pleasing effect. So um, the suggestion was to try to coordinate all of these things that might have to happen. There's no mention of how much they felt the dam could be lowered. Um, so then uh, we 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 got a coastal resilience grant to understand the rest of the watershed a little bit better. Um, you know, only about one third of this water that is going through McGonagall River in the downtown area, only about one third of that actually comes from Camden. The rest comes from somewhere else. So we, we really kind of have to care. Um, it's also a very steeply sloped watershed. So the water moves really fast and it can it can flood really fast, but it also recedes really fast. So there, you know, there are pros and cons. Um, and as everybody is trying to deal with these increased rain events by fixing their own drainage problems, you're a lot of the time exporting those drainage problems um, downtown. So the downtown TIF district, TIF, TIF district funding um, identified a bunch of drainage stuff and downtown Camden as a drainage hub um, that needs a lot of work to be able to accommodate this. Um, this is just a quick thing. This is actually from a report that the Watershed School gave to us at the time. Average annual precipitation for Camden and Rockport. So total um, can see a, you know, a, a steady increase over the years. And then looking at the, um, this is the state climate summary for Maine, the the magnitude of the 100 year storm or these extreme um, rain events also has increased significantly. So the Northeast is identified as a corridor that has overall, um, you know, these rain events have increased a lot and then Coastal Knox and Waldo County, these darker blue, those are what saw the, the sort of the biggest increase um, between 1961 and 2008. So when people say well, this never used to really be a problem, that yeah, it wasn't as definitely wasn't as big of a, of a problem. Um, so that all corresponds to the same time that um, Ken Bailey and others were were having um, trouble and starting to suggest some improvements. This. Um, just to show you is the East Dam. This is where we measure the level of, of the lake. Um, this shows about 22 inches above the spillway, which is the, that's what Ken was referencing during the 2005 storm, um, which is flooding. It's a problem. You're going to see, you know, Kurtbog Bridge and Barrett's Cove underwater, but not catastrophic. What we saw though on May 1st, even with that reading, this is Bog Bridge. And you can see the water is almost overtopping uh, 105, which is, and a lot of people were saying, well, this is more than 22 inches. Well, what was going on, this is the East Dam, and to kind of go through some of the other changes, totally unrelated to fish passage or any of that, the East Dam, the part that you see up there is the trash wreck, and that keeps things from, um, from from going down logs and different things like that. It also can trap canoes and other things. And so what happened during that storm, um, it rose so quickly and happened a little later in the season after people had already put in docks and kayaks and things like that. So it actually turned the trash rack into a second dam, which raised the level of the lake probably somewhere around a foot more. Um, you can see, you know, the waterfall effect, that's not supposed to be like that. Um, so that you know that creates a dangerous situation, which is one of many things that you know hopefully we can look at with this grant. Same thing with the West Dam. Some more pictures of the West Dam. Let me go through this quickly. This is um, Barrett's Cove. 
on that day. This is um, Route 235, which is another, you know, one of those roads in Lincolnville that we don't have to care about, but it's, um, I, there are probably some people here that do care about that. <laughs> uh, um, yes. But uh, so, you know, this comes from Moody Pond to McGonica, and um, it just, you know, that, that almost never happens, but Lincolnville and Hope got actually more, more rain, considerably more rain than Camden. Um, and so as people were saying, well, I love the lake, but for the lake, um, you know, this is what downtown Camden looked like. Um, so a little bit more from downtown Camden that day. This is the Knowlton Street Dam, Knox Mill. Um, and then the aftermath of that is interesting because um, this is why DOT hates Camden so much sometimes. They, um, that bridge, it gets, a lot of stuff gets stuck. And so in order to um, get the stuff out, they sent, um, you know, this whole boom truck and pulled out logs and all kinds of stuff that had gotten trapped in that bridge. And so that's one of the reasons that the bridge is going to need to be replaced. And it has this pier in the middle of it, which traps all kinds of stuff. Um, so this shows from above. Sometimes it's hard to remember that there actually is a bridge there. Um, people have said, well, what's the Main Street Bridge? Mm -hmm. So um, with the with the buildings, it can be a little bit hard. But so every time that you have to do stuff, like get things out of there, that, that pool has to be drained, which is um, really unpopular. Um, so overall, um, you know, it's really kind of, we felt like coming at a, uh, a time when we're sort of lucky because there's a huge amount of funding. We have all of these flooding problems. There are also some some federal and regional goals about trying to solve these things in a more nature-based way. So when we were told about the National Coastal Resilience Fund, which aims to benefit coastal communities by reducing impact of coastal flooding, benefit coastal communities by improving water quality and recreational opportunities. Um, so that could be things like the river walk and things like that too. Um, and then benefit fish and wildlife by enhancing ecological integrity. We thought, oh, if you want to go as many to that, um, that, that would be great to try to look at it in a comprehensive way and see if there's something um, that could work for everyone. Um, the, these are just a few photos of, um, you know, alewives would be one of the fish that would, um, are federally and regionally a priority species that um, these these alewives are the, a small group that comes to Camden Harbor to see if um, there's a way around the dam or up over it. Um, these are also um, brush trout that are filmed down there. Um, people love to speculate about whether, you know, is that a sea run brook trout or is that one that got washed down um, from above? It's interesting. You do see a lot of the, the hatchery trout get down there, and they do okay in the intertidal zone for a, a little while. Um, I don't know if they—that's where they were aiming to get, but you can see they do try to get back up um, if they can. And apparently, brook trout are much better at jumping than alewives, um, so they can they can make it a little further up the ledge. Rainbow smelt. Um, this is a little young of the year brook trout that was down there, and um, one of the big. Um, important things is the commercial elver fishery, which Camden is actually one of the um, most important places for that. A lot of people say that, that that's kind of the first place that the elvers will arrive each year. They're juvenile American eels and um, they can wiggle around the dam some. It's really interesting to see what path they choose. These ones were actually climbing up a vertical wall underneath the village shop. Um, if you if they get just the right amount of um, water, they can they can go um, straight up. So um, that's a you know a really important sort of commercial working waterfront thing that I don't know if, uh, has been considered all that much in the committee's discussions yet. Um, but so yeah, basically um, I love this topic. I love talking about it. I love um, learning from people. I've taken fifty million pictures. Um, I love saving all of the old articles and things like that. So um, I guess just, you know, to the to the committee, um, if there's anything that I can help track down. Um, one of the interesting things I found the other day, these are uh, just some different shots, but this um, it was 
old data from Joe Sawyer, who used to, some of you will know. Um, I am sad that I never really knew him, but I've read what he's written. He took, for 20 years, he graphed the, um, and recorded the lake levels and the gate openings at the, at the East and West Dam. He had all these calculations for how much water can, you know, what the CFS is at different gate openings, <laughs> at what point too much water is going downtown. Um, so I've scanned all of this um, and, you know, if anybody's interested and at some people like more information, some, some less, but I really hope that at least no matter what, what can come out of this is that we can just do a little bit of a better job as a community documenting our history and the knowledge that's been acquired in the past. And, you know, if, if nothing else, there should at least be a, some historical signage at the Montgomery Dam that says, hey, this is the first grist mill. And, you know, people used to have to walk 12 miles to, to, to get to a different one. And, um, you know, I grew up here and didn't, didn't learn a lot of this stuff. So thanks to the committee for being as interested as I am in this and um, looking forward to the rest. Thank you. There we are. Sounds good. All right. No, yep. I'll introduce you. Let me let me okay. out your first So this is Matt Bernier. 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 Yeah. Uh, he graduated from Cornell University in civil and environmental engineering and is a licensed professional engineer here in Maine, his home state. Prior to working for NOAA as a marine habitat resource specialist with the Restoration Center, part of NOAA Fisheries, he worked for 19 years for a consulting firm in Maine, working on dam and hydropower projects all over the Northeast, where his work included the study and design of fish passage and protection projects, hydrologic and hydraulic mo modeling, in-stream flow studies, stream restoration, and dam removal. Based in Orono, Maine, since 2008, his work for NOAA includes managing and providing technical assistance to restoration and resiliency projects under the bipartisan infrastructure law, including dam removal, fishways, culvert replacements, and salt marsh restoration. He, pre uh, he previously served as project manager and technical monitor for the nationally recognized Penobscot Bay Restoration Project and now he's millions of river herring returning to Penobscot Bay. He's also just a really good guy. Um, sometimes, I found sometimes when you talk to engineers, it just goes right over your head and you just get really technical really quick. And one thing I really have enjoyed about talking with Matt is he has a lot of empathy and understanding for communities going through this process. And I think he has a lot to add to this community. And I need to share my screen on Zoom real quick. So hold on. All right, over to you. Okay, great. Thank you, Bina. And uh, thanks to the committee for inviting Jamie and me to this today. I've been um, working with the town of Camden uh, for a little while here, a uh, few years, mainly providing technical assistance. What I'm going to start out talking about is a little bit with some of the funding opportunities that we have um right now and coming up especially through the bipartisan infrastructure law this is not the funding that the town currently has for the projects that's um jamie's um program that he's going to talk a little bit um more about but i'll i'll go through that and so um i think people know but i always like to say it so NOAA, national oceanic and atmospheric administration we're part of the department of commerce Within that, probably the most famous uh, line office is the National Weather Service. You all get weather reports and satellite reports and radar and stuff every day from them. Um, within that, I work for the National Marine Fishery Service. Jamie will talk about what he, the program he works for, the National Ocean Service. But I work for something called the NOAA Restoration Center. And we have kind of um, an interesting history where our program was actually created 
in the wake of the Exxon Valdez oil spill in Alaska. And for many years, most of the work that we did, the Restoration Center did, was related to oil spills, chemical spills, something like that. So we would manage the funding that responsible parties for these spills or injuries to the environment had to provide as, as penalties, as mitigation, um, get those restoration projects done to make the public whole um, for the natural resource damages. Um, over time, all of this expertise was sitting within the restoration center. It didn't seem to make a lot of sense just to sit around, wait for the next oil spill um, to, to uh, get busy and do a lot of work. So Congress started giving us funding that we ultimately put out for grants, do a lot of restoration across um, all the coastal regions of the United States, including Alaska and the Pacific Islands. Um, yeah. So they said it's about 30 years old, uh, partnering on habitat conservation. Um, we work with partners largely through the grants that we do. We're considered to be a pretty hands-on organization. So we're not just putting the money out the door, but we're also expected to provide technical assistance, come to meetings like these, really have sort of a hands-on role to help um, get these projects implemented. Um, yeah. So as I mentioned, the bipartisan infrastructure law, uh, a lot of you probably recall, it went through the, the news for a while, or it was a year or two, will or will it not pass? What will it look like? Well, it finally did, of course, and it was big for our program, the most funding we've ever had. On top of that, some of you may know that the Inflation Reduction Act was passed as well, it gave us an additional effusion of funding. So on top of the 891 million that we already had coming in through the bipartisan infrastructure law, we're getting an additional 484 million in the IRA, Inflation Reduction Act funding, um, and most of the funding we're putting out the door uh, to fund community-based projects for many different types of restoration. This is happens to be, I think, a marsh restoration project in a coastal environment. Well, some pictures of other type of restoration. Um, so we've been through one year of the bipartisan infrastructure law funding. There are five years that are available to us. These are distribution of some of the projects, as you can, can see in Hawaii, Alaska, both coasts of the United States, including up here in Maine. $480 million we put out the door on um, a pretty quick turnaround after Congress appropriated the money to us. So we're on the verge of um, getting ready for round two. Again, this is money that's already been appropriated for Congress. It's available to us. We're adding the Inflation Reduction Act, that $484 million additional funding available for this round two. So it's a big one. And we are putting this out, which I'll talk about each of these a little bit. Mainly we have four competitions or notices of funding opportunity that we do. One for fish passage, one for tribal fish passage, transformational habitat restoration. I'll explain what that is a little bit. And then habitat restoration for tribes and underserved um, communities. So on our national fish passage one, um, presently, the um, application uh, period is um, those proposals are going to be due mid-October, October 16th. Um, here's some alewife, some river herring over here. Um, obviously, we have a great interest in getting those upstream. Um, so this is, is about fish passage, our interest in getting sea run fish um, further upstream. And again, the award range, a million dollars to $20 million, no match required um, on, on this type of funding and 175 million available. Here's a, a little description, I'll read that and then I'll highlight a couple of things in this. And I think you'll start to see as I go through this why um, NOAA Fisheries is here um, in Camden um, looking at your particular project and why it really jumped out to us as one that sort of uniquely fit this program. So 
Um, funding will be used for fish passage that rebuilds productive and sustainable fisheries, contributes to the recovery and conservation of threatened and endangered species, enhances watershed health, promotes resilient ecosystems and communities, especially in underserved communities, and improves economic vitality, including local employment. So if you sort of parse that out a little bit, look at that, and these are my highlights here. Um, obviously, fish passage. This is you know money that's primarily available for the fish passage stuff, but it's not the only thing that we're interested in. So we're interested in the watershed health. When you think about this McGuntica project and planning what Camden is doing, it's really sort of a source to the sea type of approach. We're addressing things from up here in the McGuntcook Lake all the way down to the harbor. Um, that's the watershed health piece. Resilient ecosystems and communities. So resilient ecosystems, meaning that fish like this, as they have for thousands of years, trying to make their way upstream in the spring, find the love of their lives, um, can continue to do that. Um, you know, that's that's the goal. So even in the face of climate change, warming water, changing weather, more flow, you know, all of those things that are challenges right now, the idea is to keep that um, sort of behavior going so we can keep these species around. Um, and then the resilient communities and the resilient communities piece is about the flood risk. Um, not only do we want to benefit fish, but we want these projects to benefit people too. We want those sorts of win-wins to make these communities more resilient to things that we're seeing with flooding, sea level rise, and other climate change impacts like that. And then also the economic vitality. Again, you think about that lowermost dam right below Main Street, economic vitality, Main Street in Camden, right? All the businesses, that are down there, local employment, people who are down there working in those businesses, all the economic impact that you have there. And also as you do construction projects, make improvements, um, it's about um, you know local people who are actually building those things, local construction firms that are getting the business um, to go through that. So I won't belabor this, we have a special, Pot of funding that's available for tribal fish passage on tribal land or tribally um, sponsored projects. The other one that's relevant is the transformational habitat restoration. So this um, is really focused on something that we call coastal resilience. So again, it's about, can be about fish passage, it can be about coastal restoration, like restoring salt marsh habitats, things like that. Um, but really a big component of that is this coastal resilience piece. So if you think about sea level rise that's happened, say, you know, within the past, uh, you know, like in the, in the last century, maybe eight or nine inches of sea level rise that happened. Well, you know, a lot of roads are regularly going underwater. A lot of our culverts are too small. A lot of our bridges are not high enough, things like that. So the idea is to build in resiliency to those type of climate change impacts. Um, so again, this is another funding opportunity that we have, an award range of 1 million to 25 million. The deadline for this is a little bit later, November 17th. Um, and again, these are mostly gonna go out to organizations and communities that successfully apply for funding. Um, Kind of a wordy slide here, I apologize, but I think you'll see um, once I go through that and, and highlight a couple of things, but you know, the principal objective of this solicitation is to support transformational habitat restoration projects that restore marine, estuarine, coastal or Great Lakes ecosystem using approaches that enhance community and ecosystem resilience to climate hazards. Funding will prioritize habitat restoration actions that demonstrate significant impacts, rebuild productive and sustainable fisheries, contribute to the recovery and conservation of threatened and endangered species, promote climate resilient ecosystems, especially in tribal indigenous or other underserved communities, 
and improve economic vitality, including local employment. So <laughs> fairly wordy, lots of big words in there. What does that really mean? Again, you break it down, highlighted some of the relative things, and you can really start to see the Mugantic Cook and Camden in some of this description. So again, the ecosystem resilience, the climate hazards, the flooding that Allison talked about that was happening um, throughout the McGonagall River watershed, all the way from the lake down to downtown. The habitat restoration piece, again, restoring alewives upstream to historic habitat. Um, significant impacts, it's addressing, again, the source to the sea, the entire river and watershed. Um, six sites all together uh, with multiple dams. The fisheries piece, that's that's the alewives and other sea run fish that Allison was talking about. Climate resilient ecosystems, again, continuing to let those species, sea run species that have been here for thousands of years to restore their connectivity and their ability to uh, go upstream and sustain themselves and, and everything that likes to eat them within the river systems and out in the ocean. Um, and then again, the economic vitality and local employment are all goals of that as well. So you could sort of see how that sort of fits in with the larger McGuntacook and Camden planning. Um, we have another one that's coming that's focused on tribal and underserved communities that hasn't been announced yet, but that will be another funding opportunity that, that we have. Um, and then this is just something, I won't read any of this, um, our meaningful engagement, but that's what I talk about, our involvement in local communities. You know, we want to be here. Um, my office is in um, Orono, Maine, so not too far away. We're expected to uh, be a presence in the local communities, come to meetings, um, provide that technical assistance, and uh, really try to be hands-on with a lot of these projects. Um, just a, a little bit, you know, we could talk further about um, which projects the, the town might be ready to move forward on for some of these opportunities this year. Um, that's really it. I think I'll go back to the beginning and just leave my contact info, my email up there. All right, Jamie, you're up next. <laughs> um, Jamie Carter is a physical scientist with the NOAA Office for Coastal Management, where he develops and delivers geospatial project, products and services to support coastal management and decision-making throughout New England. Much of his effort is focused on increasing community resilience to coastal hazards through effective use of science data and tools. Jamie provides technical assistance to coastal communities and coordinates geospatial activities with federal and state agencies and other organizations. He also helps maintain NOAA's Digital Coast, a website that provides not only coastal data, but also the tools, training, and information needed to make these tools truly useful. Um, Jamie has a Master of Science in Physical Geography from Oregon State University. Prior to starting with NOAA in 2003, he worked with the USGS studying in-stream fish habitat, watershed hydrology, and land use. And he is based in Falmouth, Maine. So thank you for coming up. Thank you, Dana. And thanks, Matt. Thanks to the committee for inviting us. Um, and I appreciate everybody turning out today. I'm hoping that we have a good discussion afterwards. So I'm just going to talk through a few slides like Matt did as well. Um, and as Matt led off with, we are part of NOAA. NOAA is a fairly big organization. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and where Matt sits in the National Marine Fisheries Service, I'm in the National Ocean Service. So products that you might be familiar with that come out of the National Ocean Service are nautical charts, tide predictions, and um, 
The digital coast is what I just mentioned, and that's actually or what Bina just mentioned for me. The digital coast is where we house a lot of data and information that coastal communities use to understand things aside from tides and aside from uh, you know bathymetry. We really do try to uh, assist communities, decision makers with any other coastal decisions that might have some sort of connection with coastal hazards or local economies. So working waterfronts are very important to us as well. We're, we're in the Department of Commerce for a reason. Uh, we certainly want to make sure that coastal communities can thrive that way as well. So my expertise does kind of cover the geospatial side of things, but I am a representative here in the region. And I'm here today to talk a little bit about the National Coastal Resilience Fund, which has funded two of the projects that are here in Camden. Um, so I'm going to talk through some of what that means and why I'm here and why I can speak to that, because it's a partnership, in essence, between NOAA and another organization, um, NIFID, the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. So I'm going to dive into that a little bit here. Um, and essentially what I want to do is present to you, hopefully you all can see around me, apologies if you can, I'll dance around a little bit, but the National Coastal Resilience Fund. Um, I'll talk a little bit about some of the coastal flooding aspects of our work. I know that's not directly related to the dam discussions and the watershed discussions, but from our perspective, the coastal aspects of these hazards are, are integrally related. Um, and then a, a little bit about some of the modeling work. Um, so the National Coastal Resilience Fund, I guess to reiterate, because you have had a little background information on this already, is a program that is administered jointly by NOAA and NIFWIF. So NIFWIF is truly the lead on this, but NOAA and a few other organizations provide a lot of funding for this, this program every year. Um, ever since 2018, we've been putting millions of dollars into the program, and NIFWIF, through a process that they work through with, with NOAA and other partners, um, goes through a review process and selects projects, and then we're able to provide technical assistance and other types of services. Um, as was mentioned, the program really focuses on enhancing the resilience of, of coastal communities and coastal ecosystems. So those are the two key components uh, that make uh, projects like Camden so attractive to the program and why Camden has been so successful, because it's truly looking at both of those aspects. Um, and we are aiming with this program to do restoration work um, or mitigation work, anything we can do to enhance the resilience of communities and ecosystems. And it's really an and. We really are trying to find the, the sweet spot between both communities and ecosystems. So what is our role? Um, NIFWIF has a fairly small staff. No, of course, we've got a very large staff, but we are broken into regions. And so we try to look at these projects from a regional perspective. Um, so we, because I am based here in Maine, and I, I work throughout the Northeast region, uh, but I live in Maine, I grew up here, um, I know this area very well, and so I look at the projects that come into NIFWIF and to NOAA, we, we do have other grant programs, but this particular program is the one that I'm going to speak to today. Um, and so we help with some of the review pre-proposals and then the full proposal reviews as well. And because my personal expertise and the role of the National Ocean Service is really more from the coastal realm, when we start looking at some of these uh, stream or river restoration projects and dam removal projects and fish passive projects, we reach out to our colleagues in the fisheries service, which is why Matt has been so much more involved in this particular project than I have over the years. So it's a great relationship. We really appreciate all the assistance that Matt and his team have been able to provide. Um, but where we can, we do lean in and provide additional technical assistance on the ground. So a lot of the work I do uh, is focused on things like salt flash restoration and tidal culverts and some of the influences of sea level rise and coastal storms on, on coastal communities. So where those hazards present a risk to you know, walk, working waterfronts and other infrastructure, those are the types of projects where I'm more of a known quantity. This is my first meeting with all of you, so I just, again, appreciate that. Um, and then performing coastal resilience assessments. This is something that we do hand in hand with MIFWIF so that we understand the landscape of risks for communities and ecosystems. So this is where I can use some of my geospatial background and work with some of the data that we have and that MIFWIF has to come up with ways to understand the communities and the risks they're facing. And that's a tool that they use, that MIFWIF uses to help understand some of the, the benefits of the projects that they're awarding. Um, and then lastly, we do like to take what we've learned in various communities and, and try to bring that to other communities that are just starting down the path of, of some sort of ecosystem or community resilience project. And so we, we try to transfer those lessons as, as uh, needed. 
Um, okay. The title of this slide says NTRF Project Pipeline. <laughs> um, and I wanted to include this slide because um, I just wanted to make sure that everybody understood that NCRF, the National Coastal Resilience Fund uh, framework, right? So the National Coastal Resilience Fund, which awards all of these dollars to projects like Camden has received so far, is really kind of organized into four bins uh, based on project type. And you can look at this slide from left to right and think about it as a continuum of projects and, and, and the, um, uh, I guess, where communities are in their uh, road or their journey to achieving some sort of enhanced resilience, whatever that resilience is focused on. So NCRF uh, looks at the projects based on community capacity, um, building and planning, and then site assessment and preliminary design work, and then final design and permitting, and then finally restoration or implementation of those final designs. So those are the four main categories. And you can imagine that the dollars associated with each one of these bins increases as you go along because uh, the big implementation projects truly take millions of dollars. The planning and capacity building projects are in the hundreds of thousands of dollars each. Um, so to give you a little context here, oh, I need to get control back. <clears throat> um, the town of Camden in, uh, received a 2019 NCRF award uh, for site assessment and design. Um, and you've seen the results of that already through some of the feasibility studies and some of those initial conversations that occurred. Uh, the most recent award that was granted uh, was using some of the 2022 funding. Um, same project, but this one is now focused on final design and permitting. NCRF or NIFWIF considers this particular project or this, this watershed project a pipeline project because early funding enabled some of the site assessment work and a consecutive or the next award that was provided um, is now looking at final design and permitting for some of those uh, yeah, previously conceived ideas. And so this is a pipeline project in, in uh, NIFWIF's um, Language. Some examples of other projects that NIFWIF has um, awarded here in Maine, up in Sedgwick, uh, is the Snow's Brook Culvert. And this was um, basically a project to address some of the flooding that was occurring up there, similar to what Allison showed, um, enlarging these culverts to handle higher flows as a, as, that are resulting from increased precipitation is something that's taking foot across the country. So these projects are getting funded more and more. Um, and this particular project uh, took the culvert that you see here in the top left and ended up installing a, a bridge, an um, open bottom bridge that allows for fish passage and increased flow of capacity. So that's an example that uh, Lipwit was able to fund um, in partnership with Maine Coast Heritage Trust and Maine DOT. And then just a, kind of a rundown of the dam removal project, because we're talking about dams, among other things today. Um, NIFWIF has funded through this program some dam removal, dam removal projects. The majority of them are actually here in the Northeast. There are a lot of dams that are aging and close to failure. And NIFWIF is very interested in making sure that they are spending some dollars on addressing those issues. And so um, here is the list that uh, I was able to obtain from NIFWIF that represents some of the projects here in the Northeast. Uh, interestingly, the only project that is actually closed out uh, because these do take time was the initial Camden site assessment project. So already Camden is kind of a step ahead of a lot of other communities in terms of just starting to understand the issues around these, these uh, systems. Uh, and and the, the um, photos here on the right are actually from uh, the Patapsco River, and it's just showing another project that NIFWIF funded prior to the National Coastal Resilience Fund coming around. They've been involved in this sort of work for, for quite some time. And that's it. I just wanted to give you a quick intro um, so that we can break the discussion, and, and uh, we'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. Where do you want to fit? Here? There? Any preference? I'll turn this off. There we go. How's that happen?
Okay. Can everyone hear us okay? We tried to get a microphone set up and it just didn't want to participate. So we'll try and boom our voices. But thank you both for those introductions. Um, I think they did answer a lot of the questions. So I cropped out quite a few. Um, but I think the main one question, Jamie, I'll ask you, uh, what issues are you seeing with dammed rivers in regards to climate change and flood resiliency? And do you see, do you expect these issues to worsen over time? Yeah, so I, I kind of alluded to that a little bit towards the end there, and I did mention some of the, the extreme weather. Um, so a couple of the issues that are really um, allowing us to focus on these sorts of systems relate to the age of the infrastructure, um, whether or not they're still fulfilling their originally designed functions, the functionality of these systems have, have changed over the years. And uh, the amount of extreme weather events that we're getting, the extreme precipitation that's coming, um, that's the other thing that's really uh, kind of raising our awareness to the issue. Uh, the flooding event that occurred here on May 1st is that's not the first time that's happened and it's not gonna be the last. Um, and we do project over the next, I don't know, 70 years, you know, we're looking out to the year 2100, the amount and the intensity of these extreme events will continue to increase. And so given what we learned from Austin about the characteristics of the watershed, it's a very flashy watershed. And when we get extreme precipitation, it's gonna funnel down very quickly. And so you'll see rapid rise of these rivers, which could certainly pose a risk to the dams themselves and all those other crossings. Um, bringing in debris and whatnot. So that's the sort of concern that, you know, that we have. That tied with the coastal component. So we're seeing a compounding effect uh, with accelerating sea level rise and storm surge and how that's going to interact, especially up here in, in the Northeast where we get nor'easters that come and just sit for a while. Uh, we get uh, the compounding effect of intense precipitation and then, um, you know, agitated uh, coastal ocean um, and how that's going to affect the, the seawall and some of the, the coastal waterfront infrastructure is going to be another area that we want to look at. Awesome. Thank you. And sort of along those lines, we got another question that was asked, um, are dam alterations a feasible method for management or is the ultimate goal to remove them entirely? So when we think of management, I think we need to remember this grant had a lot of aspects to it, right? Whether it's fish passage, coastal resilience, flood resilience, you know, so as we're balancing all those priorities, do you think we're able to have a win-win situation here in Camden when it comes to alterating, altering dams versus removing dams and sort of how do we, how do we do that? How do we go through that process? And I know we have the feasibility study that sort of draws, you know, a lot of conclusions around pros and cons and feasibility of each dam and some are pretty obvious which ones we should remove and some are a little more, maybe a fish passage does make more sense. Um, but do you have sort of lessons learned you can draw upon? Yeah, sure, I, I can address that. So I think as people know, the original purposes of these dams in the Guntucook River, like elsewhere in the Northeast, um, wasn't necessarily for flood control, for creating certain water levels, it was for mill operations, for water power. And what they were trying to do is sort of maximize the potential energy at each of the sites. So the ideal was to have a large drop, as large as possible, for the water to you know, acquire that potential energy and then have it occur in as short a distance as possible. So if you think about like Niagara Falls or you know, some of the rivers out in, in New York State, they have the type of topography and and bedrock that creates these like sort of horseshoe falls types of things. And there are a lot of near, nearly vertical waterfalls. We don't really have that in the Northeast. We have ledge falls that kind of play out over some distances. So in a lot of cases, what they were doing at these sites where they had drops, where they had rapids, they were physically moving the river like they did downtown Camden. Um, we're, we're pretty sure. So it, it spilled over the falls or they were altering the bedrock to construct mills, create dams, stuff like that. So there was really no thought for flood protection or anything like that. Again, they were trying to maximize and take advantage of the energy that was in the flowing water. And sometimes these mills would only operate seasonally, like typically in the spring when um, they had enough water. 
and then they would shut down and whatever they were doing, uh, whether it was a grist mill, lumber mill or something, it might run for a month or maybe even a couple of weeks and then shut down for the rest of the year. So the answer is on the benefits of the dams, it really all depends. Um, you have to go back to the original purpose of the dams, but also the geometry of them. And on the McGucket River, um, all of the dams do not really provide much um, flood storage capacity. We'll talk about Montgomery Cook Lake maybe last, but for the other ones, they're what we call runner river dams. So whatever comes in for inflow is gonna go out pretty quickly for outflow. They're not attenuating the flow at all. They're not storing it or maintaining it for any significant period. What comes in has to go out quite quickly. And what the dams largely do, those types of run of river dams, is they actually make the flooding worse by elevating the water levels upstream of them, raising the water levels quite a bit. So if those dams weren't there, water levels could be a lot lower on those. Now, McGunticook Lake itself is large enough that depending on the lake level um, and the storm that comes in and the volume of water that it brings in, the duration of the storm, how many inches of precipitation happen and how quickly it does have some potential to attenuate the flow. But again, it's sort of like a bathtub. Mm -hmm. It's filling up the bathtub. If the bathtub is nearly full when you turn that faucet on again, well, you don't have very much time before it's gonna start trying to spill out of the bathtub. If you can keep the bathtub near empty, and of course nobody wants to empty their lakes <laughs> um, for good reasons, but if you can keep the water level as low as possible, you have a little bit more buffering capacity for that big storm or hurricane to come in, water level will rise, but maybe sort of delay um, the amount of water that's gonna go downtown, but you're not delaying it forever. Um, sometimes those delays, that attenuation could be a matter of minutes or hours, you know, days at most. Um, so it isn't like out west where there are truly big storage and flood control reservoirs that do protect communities and provide long-term storage. These these dams on the Macontic River are just not capable of doing that. Thanks. That makes Thanks. sense. Um, the committee has discussed this a bit in some of our meetings, but there's a question mark around um, as we approach the different projects, the different dams along the river. Does it matter which one we do first? Say we wanted to look at powder mills first and remove that. Um, does that is that okay? Do we have to promise to do all of them? Can we do it in a you know pilot project approach or piecemeal approach? The um, yeah, I'll, I'll let Jamie answer that too. But um, the answer is no, not necessarily. Um, some of the dams, I think, are low-hanging fruit. And you mentioned the powder mill dam, which is kind of what I would consider like a remnant dam. You know, that's a lot of debris and stuff like that. That could be quickly designed, permitted, and implemented. Um, so there's no reason why not start at some of the upstream dams. The component I think that people have to remember is that all six sites are going to have to be addressed. And within those six sites, McGunticook Lake itself, of course, has, has two outlets. So each dam is, is special, is unique, um, and it's gonna be a different thing. So we're anticipating like up here at McGunticook Lake, there may need to be more spillway capacity, maybe more gates, things like that to address some of the flooding risks that Allison outlined in her presentation, in addition to fish passage at the lake as well. And of course, you know, the lake is gonna stay here. It's valuable recreational component, um, offers habitat, stuff like that. Same with the, the Sea Bright Dam downstream, I'm expecting fish passage there. Some of the other dams are probably candidates for um, removal mm -hmm. as well. And, you know, even though the Montgomery Dam is, yes, you know, pretty controversial, um, getting fish up past it one way or the other is not going to be rocket science. There are lots of alternatives to do that. So um, I have a lot of confidence in that we're going to be able to restore fish passage to the whole system. And um, can you explain why we should care about fish passage and river restoration in general? Just 
why why is it good for the ecosystem? And there was even a question in yeah. here that would introducing any of these fish disturb the ecosystem in a negative way? You know, like, why do we care about fish? <laughs> um, yeah, no, we don't consider there to be any negative impacts with this. And if you think about what happened when our northeastern rivers were dammed, again, they were um, they were dammed for commercial reasons to create mills, to create that water power for grist mills, for lumber mills, for other types of operation, ultimately, you know, hydroelectric power for um, a lot of the dams. And, um, oops, uh, last part of your question again, yeah, sorry. Sort of like, why do we care? Oh, and the fish. And so when all of that industrialization happened, um, basically a lot of those runs of fish were extirpated from the rivers. Um, actually, they were extirpated from most of the main rivers because most rivers, like in the rest of New England, were ultimately dammed. And we lost a lot of those um, species. Um, and so basically, Camden and the McConaughey River community is missing something. You've been missing something for probably at least a couple of hundred years. And any main town that has a river running through it that is not teeming with fish, something is wrong. Something was taken from you a long time ago and we're interested in restoring that. So what does that mean for Camden? Thinking about the things that I think of, when I think about Camden, your interest in drawing a tourist and the economy and stuff like that. Um, these these alewives in particular, the river herring, but also eels, sea run brook trout, sea lamprey, all of those things are the prey base for not only within our rivers, but also our coastal communities, our offshore areas. So things that we like to eat in restaurants, including downtown and Camden, like, like Haddock and Pollock and stuff like that, are feeding on these fish in the coastal environment. Um, so what are the potential benefits for Camden? Well, you know, Allison showed some pictures of brook trout. You could fly fish for sea run brook trout in the Madonna River in the morning, go have lunch on Main Street downtown, go in the afternoon fish for striped bass um, out in Camden Harbor in the afternoon and evening because they're feeding on alewives that are out migrating in late summer from the Gantuka River. You can go for a sail outside of Camden Harbor and see more ospreys, see more bald eagles, see more seals, see more harbor performances, get a little further offshore and see humpback whales that are feeding on these fish as well. So there are a lot of benefits. And as, as much natural beauty as Camden has, if you think about the Camden Hills, the harbor, you know, the Atlantic Ocean right here, McGuncook Lake, there's this also this huge potential that's running right through the middle of the town and that's the McGuntica River um, that really, there are a lot of benefits um, of a restored river that Camden has been missing for a long time. And you're just on the verge of being able to tap into that. Thanks, making Camden sound so magical. Uh, <laughs> it hardly is. Uh, a quick uh, question someone had was, Say we do all this, all these projects, and no sea run fish come back. Do we have to give back the money? <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely not. Okay. And uh, as Allison pointed out, the, the fish are here. They're looking to go upstream. We have, you know, river center nearby already has sea run fish. The Duckrap River has sea run fish. The Penobscot River has the largest remaining run of Atlantic salmon in the entire United States this year. The Penobscot River had the largest run of alewives. Uh, maybe it means another donation just occurred to the water that is located on the drain. Yeah, so. Um, yeah, we have a lot of faith. We've done a number of these projects around the state and the fish come back and they come back in the groves. They're here, they're wanting to get upstream. 
Um, and one piece I, I think I said before I was drowned out was the Penobscot River this year had the largest run of alewives of any river on um, the entire East Coast. So obviously that's not far away. We're close to Penobscot Bay. We had millions of fish that were coming by this area this spring. Can I ask a question? Yep. Um, you know, there's been the East West Dam and Seabright Dam are, you know, off the table in terms of being taken down. So I understand that. There's been some question as to whether or not the fish passages will be feasible, um, given the topography and the steepness um, of what they have to climb up. Can you talk a little bit to your comfort level with that? Um, yeah, sure. So we have design criteria for fishways that we do or dam removals or sort of hybrid things where we have nature-like fishways that we put in or restoring former channels. Um, so different types of fish have different swimming mechanisms, um, like an eel swims differently from an alewife, say, and they all have different swimming capabilities. Um, as Allison, I think, pointed out, you know, brook trout can jump, alewives can't jump, eels can't jump, things like that. So we have criteria for all of that. And what we're looking for is velocities that are not too high, depths that are adequate. Um, there's some other components too related to the size and spacing of pools and ripples and stuff like that. But it's, um, it's amazing what these fish can get up naturally um, and have. And even with all of the dams in place, I'm pretty sure there are eels uh, that are living out there in the yeah. lake now that got up despite all the obstacles and not having formal passage out there. So yeah, there are ways of addressing that. Thank you. Um, Another question, can you speak to the changes the community might see throughout this process, not only the aesthetics, but how could removing any dams impact property lines, et cetera? Um, if you can't speak to that right now, that's fine. Um, <laughs> well, the, the property lines, yeah, trying to understand that. Um, I think people are a little curious if, you know, say the impoundments change and if, Oh. you know, turns into more of a river instead of a, a large pond. Um, how does that impact keepers? Yeah, keeper, you know, we, we've seen that on a number of projects and really it all depends. You have to go back and look at the deeds on each of the properties. Some people own all the way to the center of the river. Some people own only to a certain high water line. Some people actually have water rights um, to particular flowages. So it, it all depends. I mean, we're not in the business of taking land away, necessarily giving people land, stuff like that. Um, you know, a lot of these projects do change water levels, not like in Magusco Lake and Seabright. Um, but where we have dam removals, of course, we are changing those water levels. And it really depends on a particular property. Great. Um... Just in the sake of time, I would like to open it up to other questions from the community because um, we have these written down so we can do a little written up Q&A better. But I just, is there, are there some questions from you all that you would like answered? Yeah. If a dam or a particular dam? A dam, any dam, series of dams, what is your place is the ability to control the water? Well, that's the point. On these run of river dams, you don't need to control the water. These dams are not doing anything to attenuate floods. All they're doing is raising the water levels upstream of them, which is de detrimental. Expanding that flood zone, maybe putting more people in harm's way. So what you're trying to do with the dam removal is restore a particular section of river back to natural conditions that you had before the dam. So basically a free flowing reach of river. Yes. As I understand it, there's no proposal to remove either Seabright or the dams that are McGonagall. Correct. Right, correct. Yep. 
Yeah, what would happen there would be more a fish ladder or some sort of fish passage um, opportunity so that whatever happens downstream, still <laughs> the fish have an opportunity to get up. Yeah. Oh, the models are concerned about WD, and I think you said that you can see a lot of different alternative ways to get fish up and keep the dam. Am I right with that? Well, possibly. So one of the challenges at the site with Montgomery Dam, and this um, goes back to the question I had about like swimming capabilities, the capability of fish, is you want that sort of height of the drop to be as low as possible. That enables you to put the fish passage in, uh, in into a place where you use as little real estate as possible to do that, whether it's a fish ladder, a nature like fish way or, or a straight dam removal. So lowering the water levels is definitely beneficial in that regard to getting the fish upstream. The main thing that's been discussed with Montgomery Dam is the risk um, that Montgomery Dam has in raising flood levels at that particular area and the risk to buildings that are sitting right over um, the McGuntacook River. And it's a very confined area. There's only so much space for water to go. As we've talked about, we think there's going to be more water coming, bigger storms. We're in an era of climate change. The water's going to have to go somewhere. And as Jamie said, for dams, when it hits a dam, it has one way to go. It has to go out and, and over the dam. So. On that, I just realized we also have this question about the town of Camden received the two hundred thousand dollar gift for conducting maintenance and repairs to Montgomery Dam as soon as possible. Um, are there any types of repairs that would threaten Camden's ability to obtain future funding for river restoration? You know, basically, if we use the if they use two hundred thousand dollars to fix anything on the dam, are we then? in it are we not able to receive more funds? Oh, necessarily. I, I think a good situation for the $200,000 would be to find a way if there's a larger head of tide project that can be done that involves the Montgomery Dam. We also haven't talked about the seawall at all. Maybe we could talk a little bit about that and, and Harbor Park. Um, so that could be considered as match. But, you know, not to be too flip about it, um, we're in an era where we have to think about what restoring the Montgomery Dam really means, given the threat to the existing buildings that's there. You may think you're signing up to repair and keep the Montgomery Dam in place and as is, but are you really signing up for sending buildings downstream to the harbor because they've been demolished by a flood? If you're not willing to sign up for that, along with the dam repair, there's a conflict there. The other thing we haven't talked about is the DOT bridge project that is gonna to have to happen as well. So that's a really, um, what we in the agency, uh, and yes, we use this term, call a wicked problem, where you have this confluence of things that are coming together, businesses, buildings on Main Street, all of the infrastructure that you have there, utilities, water, sewer, electricity, you know, cable, broadband, everything. Right in that area, you have traffic through there, you have pedestrians, you have business, you have a dam that's elevating those flows, and you have buildings that are sitting in some cases right over the river, and you also have weather and climate that's raising a lot of havoc. There's a perfect storm there that's, um, you know, we're very concerned about. That's why we're interested uh, in large part in the Camden project, because this is what we're supposed to be doing. It isn't only about, we have lots of places in the state where we are working to restore alewives, build fish passage and stuff like that. Camden has it all. It has the resilience piece, right? Get people out of harm's way increase public safety, limit the damage to public infrastructure, and be able to get the fish upstream and restore the Montgomery River watershed system, the win-win. 
I'll not. Uh, all right. I'll stop asking you. I, I had a question just to follow up on that. But taking it a step further, even if you <laughs> took out one, took out the Montgomery Dam, isn't there a threat because to the buildings that are there? Because there's water that's going to try to come down there because we funneled it, trying to go even without that dam there. There's a threat to those buildings, correct? If there was a big storm. Um. Yeah, I'd refer you to the feasibility study, which talked about those buildings quite a bit in detail. Yeah. Um, it's something I know the DOT is looking at very closely as part of their bridge planning as well. Um, what is underneath <laughs> those buildings, how they're being supported and stuff like that. It's uh, pretty, pretty scary under there. Yeah. Um, it's um, alarming, actually. As, as an engineer, I'm not a structural engineer, I, you know, so I have to rely on those who, who know that. Um, there are a lot of concerns. Um, and again, the Montgomery Dam is way under its water levels, keeping them high. A lot of supports under there are wood. So some of those um, structural elements of supports are sitting in the water all the time. They're exposed to ice. They're exposed to flowing water with ice. During floods, they're exposed to greater forces of flowing water and whatever's in the water, debris and ice. So um, it's it's not a long-term break situation. Something's going to have to have to give. There's and you know the way that it happened was the way it happened in a lot of communities over time. Just people kept adding things. One building got moved or built. And then another one, and then electricity came to Camden. So the next thing you know, we have power lines on that. And then we started having bigger truck traffic and heavier vehicles on the roads. So um, the bridge needed a center pier or something like that, which took away some of the area for the flow, things like that. So incrementally all the time, we just kept adding all the stuff to this very sensitive area. And now, um, you know, it's it's kind of time for reckoning. Right. We're trying to do too much, like right in that area. And there are some definite conflicts, the main one being between the dam, the existing dam and buildings. Yeah, I have a question that relates to that. Because I've heard in the past, people say if Montgomery Dam doesn't cause flooding, and people say, yes, it does cause flooding. So how do you help somebody who doesn't understand that, understand? what the situation is, because I've heard both sides say different things. Yeah, so again, I think um, the feasibility studies that were done, both for the upstream dams and the one specific for the Montgomery Dam, really have a lot of detailed information. And I realize it's slog to go through, um, you know, 200 pages of a feasibility study, if that's not something you do every day like I do. Um, <laughs> But it's in there, you know, you can go see the photos, you can check out the graphs, things like that. You can actually see, and and if you have questions about that, you know, there are ways, the town really has some great technical resources lined up um, with their consultants, both FB Environmental and Interflu. So if people need to sit down and walk through a particular chart or something like that, you know, I'm willing to do that. I'm sure that they're willing to do that. But there are graphs in there that show how the dam raises the water levels and by how much at different flows. And then what that means in terms of the elevations that we have out there on the buildings um, and stuff like that. So I'll just add, not only does it raise the water, but it's going to also expand the extent to the extent possible, right? It is a confined system, but the extent of the flooding will also increase as a result of the elevated water surface. So that's why we're starting to see it spill out in certain areas. Yeah. Um, I live on the impoundment for the Nolan Street Dam, okay. and the bottom third of my property is considered, and that of my neighbor, is considered a floodplain. During the May 1st uh, inundation, uh, that property, most of it flooded. Uh, and uh, it seems that the amount of water uh, on the floodplain was equal to the amount uh, that would have been in the impoundment itself. 
uh, it was strike me, and I've read in other places uh, where beaver dams do the same sort of thing, and it's considered a flood, uh, uh, something that prevents flooding. So uh, is that process on an open street or service performed by the Nolan Street Dam a real service or uh, should the dam come down and let the water just zip right down into to, uh, town to whatever yeah. flooding is done there? Yeah, well, if you, if, if you think about a particular event like the May 1st event, without the dam there, the water level that you saw would have been lower. You know, we have to go back and take a look and, and oh, yeah. figure out how much it would have been lower so that area that you and your neighbor have might not have been flooded. Um, it's most significant for people who are in the flood zone, who are have property that's lower than the FEMA base flood elevation, because if you do have property, homes, buildings, stuff like that, um, you're basically, you're, like your home insurance isn't gonna cover your flood risks. So that's why you hear about people having to buy flood insurance. So they're in the flood zone. But well, this flooding in our flood zone is not a problem. For right. I'm saying, uh, isn't that a good thing for the lower river that it, this area floods? Uh, no, because it's, it's not really attenuating the flow. It, it may temporarily slow down the water, store it. You're right, there's a certain amount of time that it has to go up, but it would go up pretty quickly. It, those dams are not providing flood storage at all those smaller dams. And so the amount of water that's ultimately getting downtown and down to the harbor, the volume of water is the same from a particular event. There's a, also up above a beaver dam that performs the same thing on a meadow above it. But I guess we'd have to get rid of them little critters, wouldn't it? It's another dam. Well, yeah, that's a whole other issue. Fish um, generally could find, like little, you know, these fish evolved with beavers in the landscape even a lot more than we have today um, and figured out how to coexist. And so they would find little spots in the beaver dams to migrate up through. Or if a particular river um, had a lot of beaver dams one year, you know, they would stray to another river and go up there, spawn, um, you know, until a beaver dam blew out. But you're right, beaver dams can have the same effect of raising water levels as well upstream. Tony, yeah. Uh, two questions related to funding. Um, one is, uh, would the NOAA funding be available, available to be used on private property? In other words, to, to, to replace the structures on the instance, even though that's not public property, it's private property. And, and uh, so the other funding question is your slide also Twenty twenty three deadlines for these but right and can this market be ready to apply for those I assume in that time frame so how do we think about you know if we're not ready for another year or plus yeah how does that work well so we've had you know when I started to become involved in the project that was before we had the bipartisan infrastructure law funding in place. So that added to our existing programs. We assume that we're going to have the same programs, maybe not the same amount of funding, but we'll continue to do the same things, provide fish passage um, and stuff like that. So the infrastructure law, again, has five years of funding. I'm not sure we're going to have five opportunities to apply for that. <laughs> in that last year, we may already be engaged in a lot of projects that we've already you know, basically promise construction funding. Most of that money may, may be spoken for by the time we get to year five. That's to be determined. But, you know, the town can go apply for funding um, whenever they're ready. Um, and I'll let Jamie answer for his grant programs. Um, but yeah, absolutely, we can work on private property, private dams, regularly do that. Uh, 
that's something that we commonly do. Yeah, um, and similarly, so if it can be on private property, if there's public benefit, then the project would be eligible. And I didn't speak to this, uh, but the National Coastal Resilience Fund, which you know we're now in the second phase, um, you know, if the town were interested in going for one of the implementation grants, the actual restoration um, grant, uh, that program should be alive and well in two years, three years, four years. We are using our BIL funding to um, add additional funding so that match may not be required. Uh, we can't guarantee that year in and year out, but that, that could be something to look forward to as well. So if you wanted to pursue NCRF again, um, that could be a nice benefit of that. Okay. Elfie, I think I saw your hand up. Oh, okay. Hi. Um, I have a comment and then I have a One is I'm so glad that you talked about the feasibility report. Because I keep telling people that we'll synthesize it. I keep saying that. I'm going to make like a two pager of it so that yeah. everyone can yeah. digest well, it. Hold me to it. <laughs> it's starting to summer. Yeah. And the summer is good. Okay. Uh, but yeah, and then flipping to the back and seeing the uh, the uh, oh. rendering of what could be, you know, really, really good. Um, so I just want to back that up. Uh, and it's on, the, it's on our website. Yeah. Our CDC website. Okay, so my question is, um, you mentioned being a blue spot between community and ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Is there a thread in other uh, dam projects that you've seen where that happens that you could perhaps benefit from? Yeah, it, it, it truly is. It's the flood risk reduction combined with uh, enhancement of the ecosystem integrity. So we're talking about fish passage. We're talking about the watershed health. Um, for that ecosystem side of things. But then if we can truly address the flood risk aspect, we've heard a lot about how Montgomery Dam is increasing flood risk for some of those buildings, uh, you know, downtown and the infrastructure there. Um, that, in addition to the seawall and, and, you know, that landscape, I think would be a very compelling uh, restoration proposal. Uh, so that's the sweet spot from the NCRF perspective. Um, they really do like you know, I've been talking to the, the program manager and they really do like how Camden has brought this um, system scale approach and, and there's been quite a bit of community engagement, stakeholder participation. I think that's another uh, very strong benefit of this project. If that can continue and strengthen, uh, just to get all voices heard so we understand the trade-offs, then I think that would be yeah, very compelling. So that really puts it in that sweet spot okay. right, ecosystem and community. Right. So just to follow up on that and say the result is a big issue and it's something that comes up a lot with the aesthetics and how it looks. I'm talking about the Montgomery Dam. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was wondering how would you work with the community to make sure that our needs are met in terms of aesthetics, but also historical preservation um, in Harbor Park. And is it possible to create an instance where you can there's a fish passage, but there's also still a waterfall and maybe even a small little pond or something like that. Is there a middle road that we can go to? And how would you work with us to make that happen? I mean, I, I personally think that absolutely, and some of the feasibility work that's been done so far is, is a great first and second step and third step in some instances getting to that point. So I think that there are options uh, moving ahead um, to continue brainstorming, I think through community dialogue, just to kind of lay out what are the values, what do people really appreciate. I know, as, you know, growing up here in Maine, sailing out of the harbor here, I love the aesthetics of the granite, the park, the boats, all of that. Um, you know, I, I would love to see that persist. I'm also kind of a naturalist. I like seeing natural cascading water. So is there a way we can make Montgomery Dam continue to perform some of those functions while allowing some of the ecosystem uh, values to be expressed as well? So that's that's just my answer, but I'm not an engineer who's been involved in a lot of these projects. So I'll defer to Matt in terms of how to really proceed with that sort of work. Yeah, so, so first of all, um, from the federal government, we can't really come in here and tell a community what to do. In other words, you're coming to us with a project that your ideas, we're deciding whether or not to fund them for things like community resilience, the flood protection aspect, and then the fish passage as well. 
So we're not going to come into a community and say, rip out the seawall, put in a concrete wall, because that's going to be cheaper. We just don't have the ability to do that. And we're also subject to the National Environmental Policy Act, or, or NEPA, which one of the important pieces of that is through the National Historic Preservation Act, Section 106, is we have to consult with the local communities, but also the State Historic Preservation Office and any um, relevant tribal historic preservation offices on potential impacts to historic resources. And it doesn't take much to get up to the level where we might be impacting potentially historic resources. And so what do we have to do in that regard? Um, it's not impossible to do. We remove dams occasionally that are eligible for or even on the National Register of Historic Places. It's not a showstopper. It just means that we have to do things like that carefully in conjunction with the community. There's a lot of permitting paperwork on our side, but there's also a whole mitigation component to that too. We have to do filings, we have to do research and so on that gets filed with the state. We have to provide interpretive signage, a park space or something like that that honors the history of a particular site if we need to make changes. One of the examples that I've used um, for the Harbor Park and in particular the, the seawall, which of course is threatened by um, sea level rise is everybody likes the component, you know, the, the stone block architecture there, the construction of it, stuff like that. We can absolutely make a higher seawall that uses that same type of construction. We can find out where that rock came from, the quarry or somewhere probably not too far away from here in the mid coast. Mm -hmm. um, find where that stone is, get it cut, whatever, construct it with the exact materials that we want. Again, we're not, we have no ability to come in here, yeah. the community, give you something ugly that you don't like. That said, we have to make things better, meaning we can't fix up the Montgomery Dam and just keep the flood risk and the risk to those buildings in place and say that's okay, walk away. That would be pretty irresponsible use of taxpayer um, funding. So what I recommend, and I've heard a lot of this, especially in regards to all that's going on in the head of tide and the Montgomery Dam, the seawall and everything, um, a lot of people have said, well, we don't want any changes at all. What I would ask people to do is sort of break that down. What is it that you don't like to change? What is it that you like about the site? Is it the water flowing over the ledges? Well, the Montgomery River is going to continue to flow, probably with more water than before. We're going to have water flowing over the ledges. Maybe you like the aesthetics of the rock. Again, we can find out where the rock came from. If we have to do sort of modifications down there, in particular, a higher or seawall, it's going to get constructed with granite that came from the same quarry as the original thing and look historic. We can put signage down here. You know, we can do things like that um, to do those tweaks. Ellen. Um, yeah, we spoke a little bit at the end of the last month, but my question was um, if the community ultimately decides on something like this fish package, but not a removal of Montgomery Dam, do we still have a private resiliency issue on our hands? I think the answer is yes, because you haven't mitigated the flood risk. So that would make that particular project, not the other ones upstream, but that particular project less attractive for funding. Again, all of these um, funding, you have to apply for competitively to get. So that component of it, that resilience piece obviously wouldn't be as strong. Um, yeah, we, we would get the fish passage piece, but not reduce the flood risk. Yeah. Two questions. Uh, first, on the other east west end, seems to be obvious that they need to be improved. Now, the new funding that you talked about, is there any chance that some money could be found for work on east west end? Their second question is regarding the seawall. How much higher do you think it needs to be? 
<laughs> well, I'll address some um, damn question. Yes, absolutely. That's part of the project. Again, um, we may not have the capacity there to respond quickly enough, open gates, provide the spillway capacity. We also need to fit fish passage in there. It's not uncommon for our projects to not only install fish passage, but to end up doing dam repairs and putting in new gates and spillways and stuff like that. So a lot of that is is a component of the dam. And I'll um, let Jamie answer the oh, sea level. Yeah, yeah. A question. <laughs> uh, because there's not an easy answer, but you know, the state of Maine currently is recommending if we're thinking about the next uh, 30 years, we can expect or we should try to plan for another foot and a half of sea level rise over the year 2000 uh, average sea level. And if we're thinking about the year 2100, it's closer to four feet. However, that's kind of a static number, right? Um, what you really need to be considering is how comfortable are you with a certain frequency of flooding and what is the construction of the seawall? How much flooding can it take? How much flooding can the adjacent landscape take? So with all of those factors, you can then come up with an absolute elevation of what the top of the seawall should be. But just given what we know about the projection of sea level rise, we know it's accelerating. Um, those are some numbers to, to think about. And so it just comes down in the end to how comfortable the community is with a certain frequency of, of flooding and, and how much uh, um, force the seawall can handle in terms of that flood force. We have time for one more question. Who wants to be the chosen finale? Boy. I'd like to put the term flooding into perspective. We will be referring to the major represent a phrase in North Alam almost five feet above what it is right now. The same event provides uh, 10 inches over the one every day. So we're just to <clears throat> one basin storage area is within that mill pond that has three and a half inches of water. If I didn't have a pump pump in my basement, that would have had a foot of water. So when we're talking about, you're referring to the buildings that are, quote, flooding, but there's only one. You're referring to damage that's being done to the infrastructure supporting the more damage will be done by leaving that infrastructure exposed to frost by draining that mill pond. The foundation of those buildings were constructed with the intention that they would be covered with water. Not that suggesting that there isn't perhaps room for repair, but those buildings aren't going to be there. They're a critical to the downtown area. The main street, and you can anyone here can measure it for themselves. The surface of Main Street is seven and a half feet above the spillway in Montgomery Dam. There's no physically impossible so that to create flooding on on Main Street for adjacent buildings. It's just not gonna happen with the uh, this, <laughs> The dams do serve a purpose by the, the construction on the not um, Mill Dam is much shorter than the spillway on the Montgomery Dam. Montgomery Dam spillway is 400 feet long. The spillway on the Mobile Creek Dam is very, very deep. There is sometimes four feet of water to move that dam. So Montgomery Dam can only receive the water that has managed to get past all the other dams above it. And you made a good point that the only real uh, containment area that we have in our watershed is in Gunnison Lake. So strategizing lake levels is our first priority. So as to mitigate the flow of water downstream. We need to rewrite our 
policy regarding the lake level spikes. And in anticipation of events like we had in both October two years ago and May of this year. So I just think this is term play is being tossed around. And yeah, it does seem like it does seem like flooding does need to be defined for this community a little more directly. And um, I think the committee has talked about this a lot. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, I didn't hear a question in there, but I do assume that you probably have some response. Yeah, yeah just to that. respond, absolutely. Um, the, the control that you have within McGuntigook Lake needs to be um, looked at as part of that. That's why I mentioned that the East and West Dam um, may need some rethinking in terms of what you have for gates, for spillways, things like that, what storage you can capably um, provide there. Um, I wish I could promise the town of Camden that the May 1st event is going to be the worst that you're ever going to see, but it isn't. You know, the last time I was in Camden before today was right after the floods that were in Vermont, and I had happened to be in Vermont a couple of weeks before that flooding occurred and was walking some of those same streets that were eventually under feet of water. Um, that flooding, you know, that happened in July wasn't associated with a tropical storm, wasn't associated with a hurricane, wasn't associated with snow melt. That was in July. We've gotten to the point in New England where we can't trust our climate, even in the summer, not to create flood risk for us. And one of the reasons, um, you know, it was so catastrophic, Vermont had a lot going for it. Vermont has a lot of dams, even more than you know you have in your typical watershed like the Gonskoke or have in Maine. Those dams filled up quickly. They didn't do anything. In fact, they were worried about those dams failing and exacerbating the flood um, situation. But they didn't have a, enough warning. They just didn't have time to evacuate. That storm happened to move so quickly. And again, you know, in July, that's the risk that we're sort of the new era that we're that we're in right now, um, where we have to think about that. And again, you know, I wish I could promise that May first is going to be as bad as it gets, but it probably won't. So. Well, thank you guys so much for coming. Um, thank you for your time today. I'm excited to keep these conversations going. There's some information over here. If you guys need our email for any follow-up questions, we can be the conduit. You'll also all get a postcard if you live in Camden soon to your mailboxes and there's a survey on there. There's gonna also be paper copies of the survey at the town offices. Uh, so feel free to fill those out and let us know what you think. Thank you so much.